Now, in addition to regular single dimension arrays, we also in Java have two dimensional arrays. So given our regular class hierarchy, we have another parallel hierarchy of two dimensional array types. So for example, if we have a class Wyatt, then there is a corresponding Wyatt two dimensional array type. A two dimensional array object actually looks very similar to a single dimension array object. Whereas, say, a single dimension Apple array object is made up of Apple references, a two dimensional Apple array object is made up of Apple array references. It is effectively an array of Apple arrays. And so to its references, we assign any object which is a valid kind of Apple array. So either Apple array objects or any objects which are descendants thereof, like say, Fuji array objects. Here's an example of what such arrays look like in code. First, we're declaring a cat two-dimensional array reference called C, and we're assigning to it a new two-dimensional cat array object, and the size of that array is 3. Notice that the size of the array is specified in the first set of square brackets. Once we have our array of cat arrays, we can assign to it cat array objects. Here we create a new cat array with five elements and then assign it to index 1 of our two-dimensional array. So the reference C here points to an array made up of three slots, and the second of those slots points to an array with five slots for cat objects. If we then assign a cat to index 0 of index 1 of C, that object is assigned to the first slot of the array and the second slot of our two-dimensional array. This syntax can be a bit confusing. You really should learn to think of the subscript as like an operator. It's just unusual because we don't leave any space between it and its operands, and it surrounds the second operand, the index. But you will get used to it with a bit of practice. Now, not only do we have two-dimensional arrays in Java, we actually have arrays of any number of dimensions. So say, for every regular type we have, there is a corresponding three-dimensional array type. A three-dimensional array object is effectively an array of two-dimensional arrays. So say, a three-dimensional Apple array object consists of references to two-dimensional Apple arrays. So the general rule is that when you have an array of n dimensions, then it consists of references to arrays of n minus 1 dimensions. So say a 16 dimension array would consist of references to 15 dimension arrays. Now of course in practice, whereas single dimension arrays are very common, two dimensional arrays are used quite commonly, and three dimensional arrays at least are used occasionally, arrays of about four or more dimensions are almost never heard of. If you find yourself using arrays with many dimensions, you've probably done something wrong. In any case, whenever dealing with an array, keep in mind that no matter how many dimensions it has, it ultimately is a descendant of regular object. This makes sense and is occasionally useful because sometimes you want a reference which can hold any object whatsoever, and a reference of type object can do just that. For every primitive type, Java has a corresponding array type. And these arrays are just like any other except for one important difference. A single dimension array of primitives does not consist of references, it consists of values themselves. So for example, the slots of a single dimension int array all hold int values, not references. However, a multi-dimensional array of primitives consists of references because it's an array of other arrays, and arrays are always objects. So, for example, a two-dimensional array of ints consists of references to single-dimensional arrays of ints. So the important thing to take away is that single-dimensional arrays of primitives are special. They hold values themselves, not references. The other important thing to understand about primitive arrays is that all primitive array types inherit directly from object. And this is the case for any number of dimensions. So say, a three-dimensional char array is considered a direct child of object. So when you have an array of primitives, the only other type you can cast it to is the type object. So finally, 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 we can look at how to write Hello World in Java. So first off, if we want to start a program in Java, we launch the Java VM, 
and when we do so, we specify one class. This class must be public, and it must have a method called main, which returns void, has a string array parameter, and is declared public and static. This is the method which gets first invoked when our program runs. Otherwise, it's just a normal static method, and so we can call it wherever we like. The reason it has a string array parameter is that when you launch the JVM from the command line and you specify a class, after that you can write whatever text you want, and that text gets passed to main. It gets split up into individual strings by spaces, and each one of those strings goes into the string array. Here, we've given the string array parameter the name args. We could have named it anything we want, but calling it args is the most common convention. Args here is short for arguments, as in the text on the command line becomes the arguments to our program. Also, I chose to name the class Hello World, but we could have named it anything we want. In any case, inside the method we have this one single statement. System here is a class. It's a class in the package java.lang. That's why we don't have to import it. And the system class contains a static field called out. Out is an instance of another class in the standard library called printStream. This particular printStream instance represents standard output. And so, when we invoke its print line method with a string argument, that string gets printed out to standard output. It's called println because ln stands for line, and after it prints the string, it's also going to insert a new line character. So, this statement is going to print to the console the text hello, comma, space, world, exclamation mark, and then a new line character. After that, the main method finishes executing, it returns, and that's the end of our program. So, we've covered all the really big ideas in Java and the most essential features, but in our other units on Java, we're going to pick up the remaining pieces, and that includes some features like inner classes, generics, abstract classes, wrapper classes, enumerations, annotations, and the reserved words assert and final. Aside from these, we'll pick up the remaining odds and ends of the language, and also we'll go into much more detail about the standard library. Even once you become familiar and comfortable with all this stuff, it can still be a bit mystifying about how one should write their code in Java, and so we'll have another unit on object-oriented design.